Fala, meu povo! Tudo bom com vocês? Essa semana chegou no catálogo da Netflix o filme Os Sete de Chicago, que apresenta um período histórico muito valoroso e impactante na história dos Estados Unidos, mas também de muitas perdas para culturas diversas do mundo inteiro. Antes de falar sobre o filme e a importância de uma história como essa chegar para mais de 190 países através da Netflix, é importante reforçar que toda guerra, independente da sua motivação, segue pelo mesmo caminho de perdas de muitas vidas e sufocamento ideológico. Então, antes de partir para agressão e violência em qualquer situação da sua vida, fica aqui o alerta para você respirar, refletir e, com certeza, priorizar a conversa e o debate. Para falar sobre o filme Os Sete de Chicago, a gente precisa primeiro refletir sobre alguns momentos importantes da história e se aprofundar no conhecimento de alguns conceitos utilizados na narrativa dessa história. Então, bora lá! Primeiro, sobre a Guerra do Vietnã. É importante que todo mundo saiba que essa guerra aconteceu entre os anos de 1955 e 1975, gerando consequências sociais, econômicas, políticas e filosóficas, inclusive até hoje. Essa guerra aconteceu inicialmente entre o Vietnã do Sul e o Vietnã do Norte e acabou recebendo apoio tanto da União Soviética quanto dos Estados Unidos por conta do auge da Guerra Fria. Era uma mistura de guerra política local com a guerra anticomunismo que os Estados Unidos acabou travando e essa resistência dos dois países de entender que eles eram potências mundiais e que eles não precisavam se preocupar muito com as conquistas uns dos outros. Enfim, o Vietnã acabou sendo aí um grande palco da batalha dessas duas grandes potências e levou muitas perdas de vidas para vários países envolvidos nessa guerra. Quem são os sete de Chicago? Eles eram sete líderes de um protesto que ia acontecer na Convenção Nacional Democrata em 1968 em Chicago, Illinois, nos Estados Unidos. Eles planejaram um protesto inicialmente com um discurso pacífico, apenas político contra a guerra do Vietnã. Eram pessoas claramente envolvidas nos movimentos estudantis e contra a cultura desse período americano. E eles tinham como objetivo simplesmente impedir que o governo americano continuasse enviando pessoas jovens que eram ali envolvidas em vidas, famílias, trabalhos, estudos e não militares para a guerra do Vietnã. Eles foram acusados de incitar a revolta, de incitar o ódio e a violência pelas ruas de Chicago e, portanto, levados a julgamento. E esse julgamento ficou marcado na história dos Estados Unidos, principalmente por conta do conteúdo político e ideológico utilizado ali dentro da sala do julgamento pelos advogados, pela própria Procuradoria dos Estados Unidos e, claro, pelo juiz envolvido nessa história. E é essa parte da história que a gente vê no filme Os Sete de Chicago. É importante fazer um adendo aqui e lembrar que inicialmente foram levados oito homens ao tribunal. Um deles, o Bob Seu, ele acabou não recebendo o mesmo julgamento dos sete de Chicago. Ele tinha um advogado próprio e ele acabou sendo julgado separadamente, condenado a quatro anos de cadeia. E, curiosamente, depois isso foi revertido, depois que outras coisas aconteceram pós-julgamento dos sete de Chicago. É importante saber que o Bob, ele era líder fundador do movimento dos Pantera Negra nos Estados Unidos. Muita gente pode estar se perguntando quem eram os Pantera Negra nessa época dos Estados Unidos, até porque não é algo que a gente aprende na escola. Infelizmente, preciso fazer esse comentário aqui. Eles eram inicialmente chamados de o Partido dos Pantera Negra para a Autodefesa e foi fundado pelo Bob Seale e o seu parceiro Hugh e Newton em 1966. Eles eram uma organização urbana socialista revolucionária, considerada por algumas pessoas influentes dessa época como um partido ideológico válido e extremamente forte, principalmente na comunidade, e por outras pessoas, claro que essas acabam sobrepondo outras opiniões e trazendo aí variáveis culturais até hoje, consideravam os Panteras Negras como um grupo revolucionário que incitava violência pelas ruas dos Estados Unidos. Hoje a gente consegue observar, inclusive isso é falado aqui nesse vídeo, daqui a pouco vocês vão ver, que 
Caso os Panteras Negras tivessem sido ouvidos nessa época e as suas ideologias tivessem a atenção de quem importava nos Estados Unidos durante as décadas de 50, 60, 70 e 80, provavelmente hoje nós não estaríamos vivendo todos os movimentos e os problemas culturais que estamos enfrentando nas ruas do mundo inteiro. Para falar um pouquinho mais sobre esse filme e a importância dele tanto na vida das pessoas quanto dos atores envolvidos no projeto, a Netflix enviou para a gente dois conteúdos super exclusivos. O primeiro com o Frank Langella, que interpreta o juiz do filme Os Sete de Chicago. E ele, para quem já assistiu a produção, tem aí um, uma relevância meio contraditória dentro da história, porque ele traz todo o peso da corrupção do sistema e principalmente do preconceito mascarado sobre os movimentos socioculturais desse período dos Estados Unidos e, como a gente sempre fala aqui no canal, pontos de vistas tem pelo menos três versões, a sua, a minha e a de quem está vendo o rolê acontecer. E é claro que a Netflix também precisava enviar para a gente com exclusividade um conteúdo feito pelo ator Mark Rylance, que é o advogado dos sete de Chicago, que está aí do outro lado, vendo toda a corrupção e todo o preconceito do sistema, lutando com os ideais políticos e culturais desses acusados por incitar a violência, que na verdade estavam apenas querendo que a violência acabasse e, consequentemente, de alguma forma, mudar o mundo também. Então, curte aí. What was it like working with Aaron Sorkin? It was wonderful. Absolutely. And I say that as an actor who has worked with many wonderful people and many terrible people. It was, uh, I'd, been, I'd been told he's not going to let you change a word. Uh, he won't like it if you ad lib. Be very careful. And it was not that at all. It was generous from the first moment. Uh, the fact that he offered me the part in the first place was extraordinary to me because I loved it and I, I wasn't, I thought, oh, who turned this down? But I just <laughs> was crazy about the part and I was crazy about every day on the set, which it doesn't happen very often with that wonderful group of actors to watch every day and work with and a director who actually came up to you, talked to you, said something nice, maybe this could be a little more this, this could be a little more that. He once came up to me and said, you're pronouncing that word the way a classical actor would pronounce it. And I said, well, how would you? And he said it regular. And I said, oh, okay, sorry. I had to be very careful. It was an experience of working with someone who loves words very much. And of course, if you love words, you love what's underneath the words, behind the words, in front of the words, around them. Um, he's a very, as most writers are, he's a, a shy man. And, and lives very, very vividly in his own imagination and life. So he's, he's, not, he's not a social man or used to dealing with large groups of people around him other than his own writing teams. Um, and that's not a negative at all, but, but um, one was conscious that his main concern was, was getting the words and the situation that he'd imagined exactly as he'd imagined it, and then he was happy. So it's a job of serving that. It's not a job where you're asked to come as a fellow uh, creator so much. I have no problem with that. It's a job, you know, where you serve this 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 man's vision of, of the story that he's lived with for a long time. So I was happy for that and just trying to figure out what he wanted and and uh, answer that. And he seemed to be happy. So tell me, your performance is so strong in this. What was the preparation that you did for your character? Oh, you know, I just try and find out what the person wants and what the obstacles are uh, that are stopping them getting what they want and, you know, and come out and try and be belie as believable as possible, particularly when it's a wonderful man like William Kunstler, who I, I fell in love with and came to admire so much. And I know that his family is still alive. Members of his family are still alive. So I was very keen to try and do him justice. Can you explain the uh, research and the preparation that went into playing this character? Yes, uh, when I play a real person, as I did with Cross Nixon, I read everything I can find about the person. I don't do it with fictional characters at all, but I read whatever I can find and then I let it all go and, and go on with my imagination. 
but the piece of that character that's real stays inside me. And there weren't a great deal of books about him. Every one of them said the same thing. He was corrupt beyond all measure, and he knew he would convict them all. But I, I never played that. I just played what I believe. I played, I'm right. You're all wrong. I'm right. At the defense table. Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, Dave Dellinger, Rennie Davis, Lee Weiner, John Freund, Tom Hayden, and Bobby Seale. These defendants had a plan, and the plan was to incite a riot. I call this portion of the trial with friends like these. <laughs> my trial's begun without my lawyer. The court assumes you are being represented by the Black Panther sitting behind you. The riots were started by the Chicago Police Department. Sustained. Nobody objected. Jurors 6 and 11, they're with us. Juror number 6 and juror number 11, you're dismissed from this jury. Can you tell us why? Because this is my courtroom. We've dealt with jury tampering, wiretapping, a defendant that was literally gagged. Hey, get your hands off me! You are the first to suggest that I have discriminated against a black man. Then let the record show that I'm the second. You were alive when the trial happened. What do you remember about that time? Well, I was about eight years old in 68. <laughs> so I don't I remember a lot about it, I'm afraid. My parents were, were liberal, um, but, but we were English living in America. Um, so um, I, I mostly remember from that year the death of Robert Kennedy. And mm. as a little boy taking my wagon and acting out his funeral on, in the school grounds where my parents were teachers. But I, I've heard more about it as I've become older, but it was just fantastic to read about it and experience it through the script and through the set. And particularly, I was very moved to learn about the Black Panthers and what, what noble ideas they had and, and fully justified ideas. I, I, they'd been presented to me in a much more frightening light than they deserved. Um, and I only wish that they'd been listened to and not treated so badly at that time. We'd be in a better place now. I don't remember anything because I was just turning 30. I was just divorced. And all I was interested in was uh, running around and acting. So that polit polit the world of politics was a, 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 of no interest to me. I wasn't a very good citizen related to those things. Now I'm watching every day and I'm very concerned. But at 30, it's not, at least it's not where my mind was at all. Kent State, I think. Kent State had more of an effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. The cast is full of such heavyweights. What was it like working with all of them and the preparation they brought to their roles? Well, every actor works differently. That's the lovely thing, you know. Even if you go to the same school, you, you come out with different, different techniques, different things that, that, that convince you that you are believable. Um, different experiences. So it was a lot of fun. It's, it's the nicest part of the job really is that you get to meet many different people who are, are um, painting or playing their music, so to speak, in different ways. And you learn a lot. You learn a lot. Yeah. And it, it, it's always very, it's a very encouraging thing just some, in human activity to see the ability of actors to work together, even though they may be working in very different ways, but to very quickly develop ways of trusting each other and working together. It, that, we, we certainly need more of that. It was a totally unique experience because we all had to be there every day. There was no day on the set when all the leading actors weren't together and the 300 extras were there most of the time. So it was sort of like being in an opera or a, a giant production of something. In movies, ordinarily, you will work with one actor and see him for two days when you do your scene, and maybe you'll have one big scene, and maybe you'll not work with a lot of others. But we were together after rainy day in a little town in New Jersey from 7 in the morning until 6 or 7 at night. It was a glorious one-time-only experience, I think. Never happened again. The story has so much relevance, and especially to the moment right now. How do you think younger audiences will respond to it versus older audiences? Oh, I think this is a perfect storm, this movie. The timing of it is, and there was no rule of law about this. Aaron started it 
12 years ago, it went through so many ups and downs. Even after he offered me the movie, it all shut down and that was it. It was going to be over uh, and then it started up again and we managed to shoot it right before the pandemic started. And now it's opening two weeks before an election. What could be more? And nobody planned it that way. It's just it worked out. It, it, in a funny way, you can say it was meant to be this way. It just was. I think your question was how will young people feel? I think they'll cheer it and they'll start calling out the whole world is watching at the end of the movie. They'll do it too. I think young people particularly will like it. You all right? It was until I saw that. Martin's dead. Bob is dead. Jesus is dead. They tried it peacefully. We gonna try something else. These rebels without a job. They're a threat to national security. This revolution, we may have to hurt somebody's feelings. When you came to Chicago, were you hoping to draw the police into a confrontation? You talked a little bit about what it was like shooting. Can you talk more about what the energy was like on set? Did you all feel the magnitude of what you were making? Um, I don't know that we felt the magnitude of it. What I did think we felt was a, a particular camaraderie, a, a very... Uh, unusual uh, feeling of ease. I mean, I, I never went off and, you know, went ate donuts with them at the craft service, but I would have long talks with Sasha and uh, Eddie, and and I had just discovered an actor named Joseph Gordon-Levitt, whom I had sadly not seen before, and now I will look for him. I thought he was wonderful. I, every one of them brought something original and unique. And as the judge watching I had the rare privilege of being able to watch it in action as opposed to being part of it all the time because I was sitting back. So again, I will say that it, it's a one of a kind experience. Sasha said this too. I don't think we'll ever, any of us have it again this way. And of course, if it's a success, that's a cherry on the cake. Se você quiser saber um pouquinho mais do que a gente achou sobre os set de Chicago, já saiu o vídeo de review aqui no canal. O link vai estar aqui na descrição. Queria agradecer mais uma vez a Netflix por entender a linha editorial que a gente segue aqui no nosso canal do YouTube e principalmente no nosso site, de sempre trazer um pouquinho mais de história e de relevância para todos os conteúdos de entretenimento. É importante que a gente aprenda, estude e pesquise sobre conteúdos que não foram apresentados para a gente em sala de aula durante todos os anos da nossa vida. A gente tem que aproveitar esse momento em que todos os estúdios, todos os streamings e todos os canais de televisão estão engajados na causa de conhecimento. Nivelar o conhecimento para cima é a melhor forma da gente melhorar a humanidade e, claro, evitar futuras guerras, futuros conflitos e, principalmente, a disseminação do ódio e do preconceito. Comenta aqui, por favor, se você gostou desse conteúdo diferentão, um pouco mais aprofundado do Fala Meu Povo. Eu estou muito grata de fazer parte desse movimento, de incentivar o estudo e principalmente a cultura para todo mundo que segue a gente. E eu tenho certeza que você aí do outro lado faz a sua parte de compartilhar o nosso conteúdo, deixar o seu comentário, deixar a sua opinião e principalmente evitar que todos os ambientes da internet repliquem todo o ódio e violência que a gente já viu espalhado pelo mundo até hoje. Beijo e até a próxima. Tchau!